Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Glad you could join me. I'm Scott Linden, your host on this weekly adventure full of tips, ideas, suggestions, and nudges towards uh, better dog training, better bird hunting, and better shooting in general. In in fact, that's going to be the topic today to a great degree. We have an incredible guest with us, shot on three continents, teaches uh, Churchill style. We'll get deep into that since it's near and dear to my heart. His name is Chris Batha. You might remember him from his television program or maybe you've attended one of his classes or workshops or seen him around here and there. He's the guy in the tweed and the plus fours. But we've got a little for everybody else as well. We'll save bucks on training birds while still teaching steadiness to fall. And I'll outline another grouse capital that I've been to that a little bit further off the radar screen than many. So uh, lots in store for you today. Hope your week is going well. Hope your weekend was full of all the stuff that's important to you, including working with your dog we are getting down to it the rubber is meeting the road almost every day around here when it comes to live birds and steadiness to fall with flick that is my one single goal for this summer i would love to see him hold still on a big chucker covey flush and then hopefully i'll hit something and then hopefully he'll see it fall and then i'll send him for the bird How about yourself? On the Facebook pages, lots of talk about steadiness, however you define that. For some, it's steady to shot, some for steady to wing, some for steady to fall. Then there's all those NAVDA and VGP folks who are going even beyond that stuff. The other one, interestingly enough, is uh, extending range on their pointing dogs. Uh, A lot of that is just going to come with time. And some of it, uh, I would imagine, you can induce by putting birds farther and farther away or running in big country and then hoping there's birds out there if you don't have your own to put out. So good luck to everybody who's training in that world. Uh, Not a lot of talk about shooting practice, uh, but I know from my surveys that that's really high on everybody's agenda. Who doesn't want to learn to shoot better? My hand is in the air. If you look really hard at your right speaker, you can see it. All right, so that's one good reason. The other is selfish that we'll have Chris Batha on the line very soon. In the meanwhile, speaking of dogs, I always like to, you know, learn a little bit more, and maybe you do too, about your fellow hunters. And I thought it would be interesting to ask again. Every year or so, I ask everybody, you know, what kind of dogs they own, what breeds they own and was a little bit shocked at the number of folks in the last Upland Nation Insights newsletter. The last one I asked, what type of dog do you own? And I gave four choices. Here they are. If you own a flusher, you're in good company. About 22% of our listeners own flushing dogs. If you own a pointing pointing breed, 42%. If you own both, Man, good luck. You must be single, probably divorced, 18.5% of you. And then here was the shocker to me. Almost 18% of you tell me you don't own a dog. Well, hopefully you're in between dogs and you're shopping for one or more. Good luck on that. Hopefully uh, you're looking uh, carefully for what you want in a dog keep me posted of course on the facebook pages there's plenty of room for puppy pictures there always is all right the upland nation podcast is brought to you in part by sage and breaker gun care products crafted at the highest caliber still carrying their clp everywhere using it after every trip to the range also that new kind of kind of modular gun cleaning bore cleaning um it's a cable and mop and brush all in one and you can break it down and store it easily take a look at that at sageandbreaker.com always free shipping sageandbreaker.com 
And in the dot-com world, if you are searching, as most of us are, in fact, I just saw a headline, uh, finding new gear is getting harder and harder in the outdoor world. Finding used gear is the new hot property, and we've got a lot of it at UplandNationDeals.com. We broker high-quality, lightly used, pro-level gear from one fellow hunter to another fellow hunter. So if you want to sell something you're not using anymore, that's a good place to get started. If you want to buy something and you don't want to pay full retail for something that's maybe just a little bit broken in, Upland nation deals.com is where you want to go yeah so i promised a, a lot of talk about uh, our number three subject when it comes down to it amongst you folks who have answered my surveys and that is becoming a better shooter i can't think of anybody better to help us with that than chris batha chris was the senior instructor and gun fitter for london gun makers ej churchill and Atkin, Grant, and Lang, still doing some custom fitting. He's teaching, he's running workshops, he's designing clay target courses, he's got videos. Chris Batha, welcome to the program. Where does the list end? You don't have an OBE yet, but we're working on that, aren't we? <laughs> the, uh, I don't think I'll be getting one of them soon, but um, <laughs> I enjoy what I do. I'm very lucky. I'm one of those people that... Um, I've always enjoyed shooting from, from being a, a youth up, and uh, I'm just happy to get paid for doing what I like doing. So I can't complain in life. All's good with me. As they say, find a job you love, and you never work a day in your life. I can relate to that. But you, you just said something that I, I didn't know about you, and that is you started shooting way back when you were, well, you're still in knee pants part of the time, aren't you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I grew up in a town, a little town on the Welsh borders called Oswestry Street in Shropshire, obviously in the UK. Um, the, uh, it was a big um, driven bird shooting, you know, like there was fairly large, you know, the, the lord of the manor and um, the uh, shooting. So I started beating um, and then getting a the dog and picking up and then obviously moved into a little 410 I got for Christmas and um, it was old and I had it. It didn't come from a really rich family. Um, and then started shooting the odd plays, rabbit, that kind of thing. And um, it just evolved from there, really. So I'd, I've been very lucky in life that um, I've never really gone to work in a, a factory or an office or anything like that. I've always been outdoors doing something I love. Well, again, you know, uh, I'm knocking wood as I hear it because, um, yeah, you know, most of us can't do that. We have to kind of live it vicariously through people like you, and uh, and we get to do it on the weekends or our two week vacation. What is the thing that uh, that you found? I mean, after all that time, you're still doing it. There must be something you like about it. What what is it? Uh, I think it's uh, any any instructor, teacher, you know, like if, if a teacher sees, um, the, you know, their, their pupils as they go through the different grades, um, um, you know, uh, learning and moving on, progressing and eventually going out and performing their own businesses or going through um, whatever track of life they decide to prove. Um, there's that element of I still teach beginners to winners, you know, so... I might be teaching somebody who's um, uh, 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 an extremely accomplished shot, but he's struggling with a certain target presentation. And at the same time, I can be working with like a 10-year-old who's um, just coming, starting out to it and uh, working with them, you know, with the fundamentals. So it goes from the fundamentals with the beginners of all the age groups right the way through to the the professionals practically and it's just like uh, being a golfer or a tennis coach um you watch um uh, what they're doing it's fault cause uh correction so what's the fault why are they missing <laughs> what's the cause of the missing and what's the correction to put it right it's as simple as that really but it takes a little experience to be able to um you know analyze that puzzle for each individual I want to go back because you you, you mentioned a 10-year-old and, and children, and, and a lot of us have this much knowledge about um, uh, in, 
in your native country, what we would call a, uh, you call it a, a shoot with beaters and, and, and picker up, pickers up and, and that sort of thing. Describe that whole process from, from both ends, from the shooter's end in the butt uh, to the beaters end on the top of the hill uh, with whatever they're doing to get birds in the air. Yeah, well, 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 it goes back to um, Oliver Cromwell, and uh, when the Civil War happened, he he was wanted to obviously cut cut Charles's head off, so he he um, he, he fled to France, and in France he uh, started a type of shooting called batu, which is the skin of a drum. You know, the, in French, yes, you beat the drum, so they'd line up all the guns uh, in a field. Obviously, the the, the um, rich. Um, friends of the king and they'd form a line and they'd have two or three muskets with loaders and uh, the the peasants as such would go out and drive through the woods and they would drive out anything that came out beating the drums you know they, and the, bird, the birds would come out um, small you know hares rabbits and at the odd deer and everything got shot basically including sometimes some of the beaters yeah so the uh, King Charles came out of exile after nearly 30 years and um, was put back on the throne. And um, he brought the French batu shooting to the British Isles. And um, then from there it evolved to being more about marksmanship <coughs> excuse me, than um, to be known as a good shot was a great compliment. So they um, started shooting higher birds, uh, much more... Um, uh, organized there was not the chaos of these battues there was um uh, lines of guns usually eight to ten and uh, they'd be in steep valleys at the bottom of the valleys and the birds would be driven from cover crops to one side to the other and uh, they were tested a one in five shot would be excellent one in ten would be a very good shot and uh, they aspired to become better and better and that shooting um was put into the gun making all of the uh, patents of um, sporting guns that were, came from London, England, France, everything, uh, Italy, Belgium, they all uh, evolved from the very rich wanting um, um, a, a, a tool that could allow them to shoot more birds at distance and so on and so forth. So they were mainly made in pairs. Um, you had a loader or a trivumperates, which is three guns and two loaders, and the guns went from uh, um, being muzzle loaders to uh, break actions and to double barrels, both side by side, and in the early 1900s, over and unders. And uh, pretty much what we shoot today is exactly the weapons of the early 1900s. There's been some changes in metallurgy and um, wood and backboring and so on and so forth, long forcing cones, but... It's pretty much what the Victorians were using way back. So that was how it all evolved. You know, I um, when I started learning the instinctive style of shotgunning, um, I was reminded over and over again about some of the key differences between, say, uh, uh, a British-style uh, shotgun and uh, what we'll call today an American style in terms of the, the, um, the way this gun is stocked. And then I learned something that uh, I don't know if it's true or not. Maybe it was yanking my chain. The reason there are two uh, two triggers and the reason they are the way they are and the reason the way the gun was choked was for incoming birds. Any of that making any sense to you? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, the, 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 the double triggers, were the, the, basically, they, they were the only way they could have a double-barreled gun at first. It wasn't until they figured out how to, um, to make a, 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 a rotary um, pick up of the second barrel, but they 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 went to the um, the two barrel gun, the, you know the over and under gun. Um, so the the um, the top lever and hence the locking mechanism of the gun to seal the breech onto the the barrels. Um, the top lever was in the way, particularly in the over and under. So they they had to. Um, Come up with a plan where, when the uh, the, the striker had a the hammer had a the bevel on it that when it hit the the, um, the the striker, it would pierce the cartridge, and with a little spring, it would spring back, allowing the gun to be opened. So the side by side 
was pretty, pretty much there until the early 1900s and was still the most popular gun um, until after the Second World War into the 50s. And then all of the Axis countries um, that uh, were on the German side in the Second World War were forbidden to make um, any military caliber. So what they went over to, uh, you know, to obviously Germany, Spain, Italy, they all went over to... Um, uh, shotguns and sporting rifles, you know, like which would shoot a deer sort of thing, and shotguns. And that's where the big evolution of the over and under came from, was the, uh, the, the you know, several countries only being able to make um, uh, sporting weapons instead of military weapons. And that was where the big um, push through came through to the gun that we know today. They haven't changed that much. I know that people tell you about steel and, and different you know, everybody has their um, sales pitch on a gun, but they're all pretty much uh, the same from about the 1970s now. Uh, obviously, they've improved steel. Um, they're much more aware of gun fit. At one time, it was one fit all, and now you can, you know, through adjustable cones and things, make them fit. But most of the makers now offer a series of stocks that you can um, purchase for the different disciplines you're shooting, be it upland bird shooting or sporting players, skeet or trap. I love it. And thanks for the history lesson. That is fascinating stuff. One more question in that, in that world. And then I promise I won't wonk out anymore, but, uh, uh, <laughs> what, what we call an English stock or a straight stock, as opposed to a pistol grip or a Prince of Wales, Prince of Wales, I think it is grip, uh, whatever. Yes. Yeah. The Prince of Wales. Um, I was, uh, again, I was told the, the double trigger, the reason for the straight stock was so you could move your hand back slightly to get to that back trigger. Does that, uh, does that ring any bells with you? Yep, yeah, that, that's totally correct. They, they wanted firepower, basically. So the idea was a double-barreled gun and then a loader with a gun. So as soon as you had fired your two shots and put your hand out, he would take one gun off, the, the empty gun off you, over your sheet off to the right and put the slam the gun into your left hand, and which created an instinctive grip with a second gun. And um, the two triggers were, everybody thinks it was for choke, you know, far shots, close shots, but mm -hmm. in, in the heat of a, of, um, and the same as the, the modern um, safety the and switch barrels, and, you know, when you're flushing birds, or it's different on a clay course, but when you're flushing birds, or especially driven game shooting, you haven't got the time to swap um, swap barrels over. So the front and back trigger was simply to be able to fire um, two shots in, in quick order. And people still think it was for, if the bird was far off, you'd shoot the right trigger, and if it was close up, you'd shoot the left trigger and, uh, or the back trigger. And quite honestly, it, it, especially in driven game shooting or a, or a heavy flash of quail, um, you're a better man than me, Gunga Den, if you can... Um, while you're shooting and trying to do something that's instinctive, I, have a thought process of what trigger you in a pull. <laughs> I, I'm glad you said that, Chris Bath, uh, the expert shooter and shooting instructor, because I was just thinking the same thing. I can't fit that many thoughts into that moment of time, so I'm just going to pull whatever trigger is handy. I think, uh, you know, exactly. <laughs> and it's usually the back, tr the front trigger first. Yeah, sliding back, the hand comes back to the back trigger and. That, that's how it was meant to be shot. Yeah, and um, it's it's very natural that, that, movement, it. so I, I get it. Uh, hey, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, the host. That's Chris Batha. Chris, I cannot, I cannot name enough of your memberships, accomplishments, everything the, from the British City and Guilds, that one I got to ask about, uh, to the British Clay Pigeon yeah. Shooting Association, Association of Professional Shooting Instructors, et cetera, et cetera. But that one just, uh, that one just piques my curiosity. What is the British City and Guilds? Uh, well, the, 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 the City and Guilds w was brought out once again uh, after the Second World War yeah. uh, to train people with skills. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so you know, i.e., you would get a diploma having done an apprenticeship. And um, that was it. And they, they actually introduced it into, um, into shooting. But more than any, the, the, the thing is the governing bodies of shooting, yeah. which is the, the British Clay Pigeon Shooting Association, BASC, British Association of Shooting and Conservation. Uh, there's several of them. Um, they 
sort of took that over themselves, and um, it, it's it's just a qualification that people can recognise that uh, the safety always comes first. So they, they're they're all not only are they a safe gun, you know, safe person themselves and proper gun handling, uh, they can instruct other people in in the aspects of safe handling of the shotgun. You know how it should be carried, how it should be put away, how it should be cleaned. Yeah. Um, uh, that that kind of thing, being able to you know recognise the different cartridges, just simple stuff at first, and then um, after that, it, it, there's rising grades of it, and there's governing bodies now. Obviously, um, I'm a member sort of member of the Worshipful Company of Gun Makers, which from the 1600s has been proofing all guns that are sold, um, are made in the UK and sold abroad, or if they're um, so come in from abroad, they're put to a rigorous proof test. Um, now, when the, with the you know the European market, they've all got um, a level playing field. They all accept each other's proof marks. But every sporting gun and military weapon um, is put through proof before it's allowed to be passed sold or to the individual or the companies. Oh, when we when we were off mic talking before we started today, uh, I promised that we would go down some rabbit holes, and there's another one. We could spend all day talking here, but to a to a to a great degree, a lot of uh, our listeners uh, understand what proof is, but not how it's done. Can you give me a sixty second explanation of how you proof a gun? Yeah, uh, basically the the. the... They, they obviously safe areas that are built in, and they have a. Uh, it, it's like almost like a lathe, and on it they've got a, a, a block, and they fasten the barrel of the, the gun and the barrels into that um, sliding. Um, uh, I can It's like a sleigh, small metal sleigh on, yeah, the, on yeah. the thing, and then they yeah, they have modern detonators now. In the old days, they used to have string around the triggers and the loop would come outside of the steel door, and you would hear the cry at the uh, London Proof House, um, ears, ears, watch your ears, and all the people working there would put their fingers in their ears, and the guy would pull the string, and you'd hear this detonation, and then he'd leave it a few seconds, then they would go in, and they'd um, look to see if the barrels had blown up or not. If not, they'd take it back, and they would put it on a, a sack of sand, and they'd take the uh, proof stamps, and they would stamp it proofed, either London or Birmingham proof, wherever it was proofed, to say that it was um, it had passed proof and was safe to use. That is, and, uh, that's still, you know, that, that still happens today. Yeah, that, that is how every single gun in, in the UK um, that is made new, or if if it's um, you change the wall thickness of the barrels or lengthen the forcing cones, any of those kind of minute things, uh, they have to be reproofed. That description is right out of a Dickens novel. I could see him working that into a story very easily with <laughs> string and yelling and all that. Um, Chris, you, well, you, often a tangent. Sorry, yeah, go often ahead. a tangent from that is every military cannon, every military tank, anything you see are all proof by the London, well, the London or the Birmingham proof house. Anything that's made, um, you know, from a four ten. Uh, um, shotgun right the way up to a tank um, or a, 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 a fighter planes um, machine guns they, they are all proofed yikes I wouldn't want to be the neighbor to that Birmingham proof house that's for sure <laughs> uh, Chris Bath uh, we, you know, we talk a lot about and we will talk much more about all of these more uh, technical uh, geeky things but uh, but in the course of doing all of this, uh, of course, I got to know you first from doing a, a television series called uh, Wing Shooting the World, uh, which, uh, yeah. you know, I'm jealous of. And, uh, you know, while I still get to do that a whole bunch, uh, I didn't ever go to the places you went to. And, uh, well, maybe once. But um, are you still able to get out and actually do any hunting these days? I mean, you've got such a busy schedule with workshops and lessons and course design and all of that. Can you work in a hunting day? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, um, from the fall, from the start in August, uh, right the way through the start of the Grouse, the Glorious 12th uh, in August, right the way through, you know, it starts October as Partridge or, or um, 
and uh, then it goes on October 1st, it's a pheasant. I'm usually in the UK with groups of um, teams, American teams mainly, mm-hmm. and uh, we'll stay at castles or, depending on budgets, nice country hotels, and um, usually a team of eight guns. A lot of the wives like to come over, obviously. Sure. <laughs> That's the bait the husband <laughs> used to, <laughs> to secure. <laughs> and uh, they come over, my, my good lady Sarah, she looks after them and takes them on trips and different venues and everything during the day and uh, we all meet up in the evening for dinner but um, yeah I've got with, with uh, COVID coming under you know, the vaccine and different things um, we've got teams coming over September, October, November we don't normally do anything in December it gets so cold and nasty mm-hmm. but uh, yeah we've we got shooting because everything's opening up again, which is like... Yeah, including, including the, the travel part itself, which seems to be the big hang-up. It was for American shooting uh, in hunting lodges this past year. The travel itself yeah. was the was the hang-up. Uh, you know, I've forgotten already, but uh, if, if, if anybody out there wants to learn more about all of these things, Chris ChrisBathaShooting.com, and I'm just going to spell it, C-H-R-I-S-B-A-T-A. T-H-A, shooting.com, everything right there from philosophy, which we'll get into a little bit more, to um, those trips and and all of the ways you can learn more about Chris and what he's doing, all of his... Uh, it, uh, DVDs. You, I mean, you got you are the Renaissance shooting man out there. What else are you doing that we mm-hmm. might not know about? I do a lot with the youth teams, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be a member here in, down in, um, in Savannah at Forest City Gun Club, probably it, it is the oldest gun club, or one of the oldest gun clubs in America, and the facility is incredible, um, not only is it beautiful lakes and, and landscape, but um, huge skate fields, uh, they have the, the Kriegoff Cups on next week, um, Massive lakes, and then uh, two 15 station sporting plays courses, two five stands, one covered, one open, dove towers, everything. So I usually try when I can to work out of there. I do travel quite a lot normally, go up to work with all this and out to uh, California with um, different um, venues I've had relationships with down to Texas. But um, the, the Forest City Gun Club is great for me because. Um, a lot of people, especially the ladies, <laughs> like Savannah. <laughs> and oh, so yeah. A lot of people come down and make a trip of it. And we have, you know, anywhere between one and a few days where we can work on anything that they, they'd like to, you know, from, from skeet, trap, sporting clays. And uh, as I say, we have the dove tower as well, so we can do some passing shots and similar to driven game shooting. And uh, the rest of the time, I well, obviously COVID stopped that. And, um, I'm just getting back into the uh, the saddle to go off to August coming up to the uh, big event we do every year with them of um, like a shooting skill for the August. Uh, nice. Up in San Donato, New York. Wonderful course. Been there, done that, had a great time. Can't wait to get back at some point in time. You know, um, <clears throat> back to your your uh, your television experience and your your travel experience, uh, in including uh, the United States, but not limited to. If you were able to hunt just one more time in one more place, money no object, time no object, we'll just transport you there via the uh, Star Trek, you know, via the Starship Enterprise. Uh, where would you go? Uh, if it was a one-off shot and, and, yeah. and had to do it, I'd uh, pick the glorious 12th and uh, grouse shooting, a day of grouse shooting on, on one of the famous moors. Um, you know, the Duke of Roxburghs, or the, 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 he's got a fabulous moor just on the Scottish Yorkshire borders. And if people don't know what the grouse are, it's mm-hmm. probably the fastest, hardest to hit flying bird. Um, they come skimming over the heather in packs, um, they, they could be as many as 50 in a pack, 80, 100, and they come and they look silly. They, <laughs> they're a, a comical-looking bird. You see them and they, they think, but once they start flying, it's probably the most, um, without a doubt, it's the most challenging uh, wing shooting that you'll ever do. Um, it's extremely expensive because you can't breed them. They grow in the wild. All the moors belong to the, the landed gentry, so it's invitation or a deep pocket. But if I... If it was on my bucket list, 
I would opt for the glorious 12th um, on the grouse moors. And, of course, uh, uh, the first thing that makes us jealous is not even where you are. It's the fact that you can hunt grouse on August 12th. That, that yeah. we, we all wish we could do that. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's it's uh, the, England, as I say, the, you know, it started with royalty, yeah. and then there were hangers on, and then it went to the you know the landed gentry, and it increased. And um, it's a huge part of the economy uh, for the, for the UK. But unfortunately, um, the antis have been trying to um, find ways to. Um, to, to stop the shooting, they, they've come up with like you, the parasites are being eaten by the pheasant you put out or some nonsense. Uh, but this last time they've come up, they've managed to get lead shot banned for shooting birds. And um, everybody's, um, if you shoot steel, can you imagine the, the, the Purdies and the Hollands that have gone through generations of families and they, they, they the, the guns um, can't cope with the, with the steel and, uh, it, it's their way they've gone all round in circles and now they've really found a niche but um the proof house and the gun makers uh, have all got together and they're finding solutions i.e if you you know you can drop the chambers open the chokes for steel um you, the, obviously the bismuth this is the thing is the the non-toxic shots that don't um uh, damage the barrels are very expensive. They sell them in boxes of ten instead of twenty-five. But, oh, I know. <laughs> uh, I think that if you, yeah, if you're shooting for, for for going over there for three days, uh, a week or whatever, and you're going to um, stay in a nice hotel, a stately home, you're going to shoot birds, and it's not a cheap venture. So in reality, the the bismuth um, shells, and they've coming up with new wads that completely encase the uh, steel. So you can travel down the barrel. They, they, they've, they've been ahead of the game on this in the, in the proof houses. Um, it's still relatively um, it, it's ex- its nature because of you know what it is. You're talking about large areas of land dedicated to bird um, rearing and bird shooting, and so it, it, you know there's a lot of people, keepers, pickers up, beaters, all kinds of um, people who are in the jigsaw that make it work. And I just think it would be a terrible thing that if it um, if it uh, disappeared. So I'm pleased to, if it cost you, you know, twice as much for the shells, for the non-toxic shells, it, compared to the overall package, it isn't a great deal of extra money, really. You know, so yeah. I'm hoping that it all gets back together, you know. And it, it seems strange that we've got a conservative government who all shoot, and they've let it go through. Well, you know, in a lot of ways, I, I hate to say it, but the UK is uh, the United States 10 years from now in any number of political areas. And I don't want to end this segment of the Upland Nation podcast on a uh, kind of a downer, but uh, I will remind you all that we're going to delve deeper into, uh, well, here's what you get to do, Chris. This is your assignment during your two-minute break here. Prepare to take us on a grouse hunt in the moors and uh we'll uh we'll look forward to that as well as uh, public access advice and a dog training segment coming right up featuring uh oh it's a way to cheap out a little on birds so that's all coming up on the upland nation podcast chris you get a moment to breathe while i get a moment to talk And the first thing I'm going to talk about is Dr. Tim's performance dog food. Got a question from a good friend. Back in the days, we got to meet every opening weekend at the Cabela's store in Mitchell, South Dakota. George asks, he's going up, he wants to go up a few notches from his current dog food. Not for George, for his dog, Samson. Keep up the good work, my friend. They want a little bit more out of their food, and he asks about a minimum protein and fat. And, of course, Dr. Tim Hunt has a large variety of 
choices in that world from the types of protein to the amount of protein and fat in a particular formulation. So for George and Samson, I've recommended at least a 32% protein and another 24 or 26% fat content in that food. But the key to all of that is the quality of those ingredients because there is a massive difference. You can learn more about why Dr. Tim Hunt, veterinarian and sled dog competitor, thinks those things are so important and how it manifests itself in your dog. Just go to drtims.com, learn more about the ingredients, where they come from, and then apply a 30% discount to your first order when you use the code Upland Nation. Good luck, George and Samson. Hopefully I'll see you next opener in Mitchell, South Dakota. As I've said, and I'll probably say again later in the summer, the big goal around here is teaching steadiness to fall. Flicks pretty good, even on simulated covey flushes with my training birds here. Um, But I keep losing birds to all sorts of things from Cooper's hawks to some mysterious in coop disease. Nobody has enough training birds. Usually they're pigeons, but they could be something else. Caternix quail or something like that. You don't always have to kill those birds to teach that final aspect of steadiness to wing shot and fall. A lot of ways to keep those birds alive and reuse them over and over. You know, like reduce, reuse, and recycle. Pigeons as well. First thing you can do is tether them. So if you're flushing birds and you've got enough fishing line or something like that, attach it to one end, at one end to something heavy and the other end of the bird in a way that doesn't cut off the circulation in his leg, for example. Another way is to make sure when you're doing that is to tether your dog, use a check cord. The last thing you want is the bird to fly up, go down, and the dog break. That spoils all the fun. You can also do what they say, card, that is attach. It used to be just a big slab of cardboard attached to the bird's leg via a little string. That'll slow their flight down enough and tire them enough to where they'll give up after a you know few dozen to a few hundred yards. I use my bird launchers with dead birds in them. Yeah, as long as you're working on it in a controlled manner and in a controlled place, dead birds fall just like they're supposed to be dead. So consider that. Next time you're wondering about the cost of every one of those stinking pigeons every time you shoot one. You do not have to always shoot them. That's the Handle It segment. Hopefully, you learned something the easy way. Because I learned it the hard way. I promised to ask you to um, uh, to stamp our passport. We're, we're at Gatwick. We're on our way because it's August 11th. We're going for the glorious 12th. We're going to the Moors. Take us from uh, from that morning. Let's let's go through how that all works. Yeah. Well, the, the first of all, you, you the, the, the once again the, the grouse. Um, the, the, there's a bug um, in the water, and um, the females have the, the the equivalent of a vaccine to it. And so, if you put out, um, you can raise grouse, but if you put them on that grouse more, the second they they, they um, take take the the bug. They, they all would die. So you can breed them in captivity, but they won't live on the moor. Mm-hmm. So the, 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 the grouse are truly wild. They're, they're, they're born there, and they're looked after. They're cosseted. They, as I say, the keeper will walk large acres and, and the underkeepers, and they have a clicker, and they'll click and count the number of grouse because you have to leave a sufficient number to breed for the following year. And then it, it's temperamental the weather comes into it. If you if you have torrential rains and it becomes the wars are sodden and everything, or you have snow, you can be in the middle of the, 
the, the summer and have snow. That's how high up the grouse are. Oh, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. You're, you're at the weather as well. So um, th- that's what uh, why grouse are more expensive than anything is the, the scarcity of the grouse moors, uh, the, the way that the birds have to be um, managed and mollycoddled, really, looked after, and, um, and, and, and the way they're shot. And the... the you imagine a, a grouse moor, it's purple heather, it's August 12th, and it's just this sea of purple heather rolling away from you like a, like a gentle wave. And uh, you're sunken in a butt. The butt's being dug out. Lots of them were dug out in the Victorian eras. And their chest, if you were standing in it, they're chest high. And uh, they're all lined with heather and, and, and peat blocks. And some of them are made out of wood now. But So you're there, so your chest height. And they have a thing called the, uh, they call them windows, and there are three sticks that are hinged on the two sides, and your loader will stand and he'll frame the person and then point the sticks in so that when you look left or right, you're looking through the sticks at your fellow gun. Yeah, yeah. And it also stops you in the heat of battle swinging through the line and shooting your fellow gun because you have to go up and over the sticks. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, and, and, and that is a, a, yeah. a kind of one of the very first, uh, way, like you said, way back in Victorian era, that was one of the very first range safety rules, wasn't it? Yeah, yep. And uh, the, the, the other thing is you should always take the grouse as far out front as you can, and you shouldn't really shoot them when they come through the butts. If there's birds in front, you take the birds in front, but, um, it, it, you know, towards the end. And you don't start shooting the birds when they go away. Um, a lot of people do. So the thing is, <laughs> the, the most important thing is footwork and and gun movement. So there you are. And the other thing that happens, <laughs> people, <laughs> there's two things that happen. The midges there in, in, in the <laughs> summer are brutal. And and so the, the, the best thing you can ever invest in is really, <laughs> really, really good uh mosquito block otherwise you'll have hives all over you by the end of the shoot Ow. um yeah it, it's just how it is so you have two guns pair of guns and a loader uh the the, the the spectacles are stuck so you don't shoot down the line with your people and you have to hunker down in the blind you put your gun flat on the on the front and you you get ready now they're bringing in literally hundreds of acres that they'll have started while you're still finishing a a, a, a drink between shoots or whatever, or a snack. They're bringing in acres, you know, you, I mean, vast amounts of land. And they, they come in like the, the horns of a buffalo. They start out, and they're, they're pushing pushing round in, and then the horns go round to stop the birds breaking out their sides. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're coming and coming. And at first, you'll see the grouse. They, they, they can't pressure them because they'll fly too soon or they'll break out the sides. So they push them gently, gently, gently. And then you'll, you'll see the grouse will start coming over the horizon and dropping in, just dropping in, and they're coming. So that's the signal to get ready. You know, so now you've probably been standing in that butt for easy half an hour, 20 minutes, half an hour, while there's no other way of doing it. It's not like a pheasant or a partridge shoot where you can practically put the line in, start the shooting straight away. So they're dropping in, dropping in, and they, 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 they chatter. They've got this silly little, you know, and, uh, so they're all chatting away. So then they, they push them gently because otherwise they'll just break. And all of a sudden you'll get maybe 80 or 100 grouse just lift out of the heather. And they, they're, they're, as I say, they're like jet fighter planes coming. And they're all swapping and swerving and curling and climbing and diving and everything else. And what you have to do is hunker down on the butt so they can't see your face and your load is behind you. And you have to take the first shot when the bird's about 80 yards out. Um, and the reason for that is by the time you pull the trigger and the gun ignites and sends a shot out, the grouse are so fast that they've covered off that distance. Wow. If you wait till they, get, they, wait till they become a big grouse, you know, like a, you can see it perfectly, that thing's going to go past you like a rocket. You have to take them way out. And the, the thing is you take... You know, the first one, and, and you get your nose over your toes, you hunker down in the butt, and you just don't hesitate. You just shoot, boom, boom, and then change your guns with your loader, and you keep shooting until the birds come through the uh, through the line. And then um, after that, some people are allowed to shoot behind, and what you've got to do with that, 
um, different wars have different rules. You stand to attention, the muzzle's right up in the air like a guardsman, mm-hmm. swing around the foot and then come down and shoot going away. It's taboo to swing through the line. That's how a lot of people get injured, is when somebody's caught up in the excitement of it, locks on a bird and it comes through the line and he shoots down the line. That's usually go home and uh, think about what you did. <laughs> so, yeah, um, that's... go ahead. Yeah, the, the 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 thing is to take them early, and uh, you 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 take them early. A lot, as I say, a lot of moors don't like the bird shot behind. Others, you know, don't mind. But you've got to have that direct discipline, like a guardsman outside of Buckingham Palace. Stand up, gun in the air, pivot round behind, gun down, and take the departing bird. You can't swing through the line, and that's what the sticks that they call spectacles are for. That if you do break the rule without realizing it, the heat of battle you have to come up and over the sticks. And that's why you frame, when you put the, the sticks in, the spectacles in, you frame the next next butts um, on either side, you frame the shooter, so that even if you get caught up in the, you know, in, in, in the, the um, excitement of the, the, the grouse drive, you'll go up and over the spectacle, and, and you still will get told off, but the spectacle saves the disaster. Oh, I bet. And, I... um, yeah. And you'll have about somewhere around, depends on, on, on the thing, but usually about four drives, two in the morning, lunch. And the lunches are phenomenal because they come up, there's nowhere, they have boffies where the um, gamekeepers and the sheep herders used to stay, little big stone boffies. And they'll have one converted and you'll go in and have lunch and um, tell tall tales about the pair you brought down. And uh, and then you go back out for, for a second innings, usually two in the morning, two in the afternoon. And then you go back for a wee dram, and um, there's uh, tall tales. And I, I can't say it on the podcast, but some some um, shots are st- extremely exaggerated. <laughs> oh, I, so, I would imagine that is uh, exactly what happens uh, afterwards. <laughs> what is yeah, the... Yeah, what, so they, 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 what is the biggest, I mean, what if you really, what if people were complimenting you at that aspect, during that part of the day, what would they have admired most? What kind of a shot or what kind of uh, thing would you have done to acquire admiration? It, 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 yeah, well, it, it, taking a life, the, 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 uh, left and right, right and left, you know, taking a pair of different grouse. If you can drop a pair, uh, take the first one out, probably like 60, 70 yards away. By the time you shoot it, it's 50, and then take the second one at 40. If you can drop a pair of grouse like that, that's considered excellent, um, you know, like superb grouse shooting, because there might be, as I say, there could be like two, three, four, five hundred 500 of them wow. all mixed up and coming wow. in different things. And then they're moving. They, they, they don't fly in a straight line. They're sort of sliding sideways, drifting right ways, you know, going and climbing high or, you know, the last second they might just swoop up and go right eye above the butts or come clean through the butts where you practically, you know, your reaction is to duck. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 uh, it, it, but you, you, you can't describe it. It's God's lost wilderness. And in the, you know, the August 12th, you know, the grouse, it, it's just phenomenal people. And I think the people who've got, the, the 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 I don't like to say the bankers, but yeah, they, yeah. they'll fly up in a helicopter. Ah yes, and uh, they'll they'll start to drive after the first drive. That helicopter will take their grouse, the the ones they've shot, uh, back to Rules in Maiden Lane in London, which is the famous uh, uh, wild game uh, restaurant. And um, after they finish the day shoot, and they jump in the helicopter because it's come back up for them, and they go back to Battersea Alley Port and land, and then they go straight to Will's Restaurant, and they have the first grouse of the season on the Glorious 12. Of course they do. What else are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. But, uh, you know, God bless them and good luck to them, because uh, it, it's their their participation that's yes. keeping the grouse moors. Um, the, 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 you know, because otherwise, the, the, the grouse moors would decline. They, they, they just... It, it, they're kept in the shape and 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 the, the, and the birds' uh, habitat is is basically kept there because of the shooters, because of the uh, the, the expense of shooting driven grouse yeah. pays for the upkeep of the moors. Yeah. You know, it, oh, 
in over here, of course, we have a different model, but over there, to a great degree, conservation is funded by capitalists. And, and, exactly. And, and that's, uh, you know, that's something a lot of people don't get, uh, and I'm not going to belabor mm-hmm. that point, but if, if it wasn't for um, private wealth, uh, there would be no hunting and to a great degree no shooting. Uh, over there, you, you call it shooting. Uh, there'd be no mm-hmm. fishing for that matter, but that's a story for another podcast in another world. Oh, yes, yeah. Uh... But um, uh, the, 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 what you said is true. But the shooting goes from from your average person who buys a couple of days. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of, uh, somebody who's got some land and, and and ten or fifteen have got together and made a little shoot for themselves, and then it escalates, you know, through to this, you know, the high bar that everybody sees um, in the movies and so on and so forth. And it, it's um, it's the habitat that they're the, the conservation. That, that they're doing is that, that that's why there's so many birds there that need to be shot so that, that, you, that come the following year you've got a new hatch and there's uh, there, there's all the resources required for that hatch to you know to grow into full full bloom as such and uh, it, it's it, it is the money that that's spent on, on I mean, it, it seems excessive and looks it and it's what the antis use a lot but the fact of the matter is the grouse moors wouldn't be there. They, they, they. What could they do with them? Put sheep on them? Yeah, <laughs> let's hope not. It, it, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, yes. it's as simple as that. There would be no. It well, is. there'd be the odd couple of wild ones that survive, but there, there wouldn't be any. No, uh, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. That's Chris Batha. Chris is all things uh, English shooting and. Shooting to them is hunting to us to a degree. There's a, a various versions of that over there as well. But I'm Scott Linden, your host. And, and you know, Chris, one of the things, one of the main reasons I wanted to talk to you is a selfish one. And that is I am revisiting my own learning experience when it comes to instinctive shooting what you call churchill style and uh let's let's just get into that a little bit because i i do want to enlighten people to that and help them become better shooters no matter what style they're using so um first off just explain this concept of the churchill style to us yeah but it, it's all built around fundamentals and, and and the fundamentals of good shooting is um, footwork. You know, you you have to be able to move your feet. And uh, you know, it, it, it's almost if you watch a team of guns that are really good sh- uh, shots, how they rotate around their foot and step into the line of the bird. It's, it's almost like watching a, a coordinated dance team. Mm-hmm. And um, and and that what that does is it, it stance. Well, footwork to begin with, stance, and then you posture. And what you're doing with these things um, is creating the the zygomatic buttress or your cheekbone and your, and your shoulder. The gun's made to go into the shoulder pocket um, and be in the cheek underneath the, the zygomatic buttress. And the gun's made so your eye is the rear side of the shotgun looking down the rib and out to the bird. And um, so, as I say, basic stance, posture, head position, and essentially a gun that fits. Um, if the gun doesn't fit, you have to wiggle your head, and uh, you, know, you, you have to try and make it fit. And, and when that goes on, the end of the gun, you don't realize it's doing it, but it's going an eighth of an inch of the gun is two feet at 40 yards. So if you've dropped your head quarter of an inch, you, the gun's gone up four feet. And uh, you, you, you have to have, as I say, fundamental stance, posture, head position, and practice your gun mount. And the best way to do it is with an empty gun, and have a mirror in your den, or you know, if you've got somewhere to put it safely, and the empty gun, and look in the mirror, and mount the gun to your cheekbone, and just look at your eye in the mirror and see that the gun comes up with your eye looking like a little rising sun, looking back at you down the gun, down the rib of the gun. And um, the more you can do that, the more practice. Um, the the, the, the how silly, you'll slow the birds down because of smooth movements. Um, I don't know if it's a true story or not, but somebody went out to um, interview Wyatt Earp back in the um, the day, and the reporter was talking to him, and he said, Mr. Earp, I'm in awe of you. You know, you were the, must have been the fastest gun in the West. You know, you took on all these great gunslingers, and you beat them all, and, 
And he said, son, I was never the busiest, the fastest. I was the smoothest because smooth is steady and steady is swift. And that's basically what a good you know, shotgun shooter should be, smooth. I, I love that analogy, and if it wasn't true, it should be. Let's make it so. Um, <laughs> you know, but a lot of people, th- th- well, from f- the style I learned, um, your your foot positions were slightly, if not radically, different depending on, uh, on uh, whose other style you might have used. Generally speaking, Chris, where are our feet going to be for a, you know, straight shot? A straight shot, your feet would be on 12. If you can imagine a clock, you were standing on the hands of a clock, you'd be on the 2 or 12, yeah. and your other foot would be, be round about uh, 130. Okay. All you know, right. that, that's for a right-handed shooter. And then what you do is, if the, if the bird is, is going hard right, you use the back leg to pivot around and step into that same, uh, same 1130 uh, two, you know, you, you, and, and hit the bird. And if it's going the other way, you, you pivot around the back leg again, and, and, and it's, it's as if you had a rod through the shoulder, through your hip, through your right foot. This right. is for the right-handed shooter. You, 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 you pivot like a door. You know, a door yeah, would work on yeah, the fingers. Yeah. Yeah. So, so as the bird's coming, you read the line, and you just step into the line so that you're all square to the bird, and you, you've still got full rotation in your body. And, and you see people, they can't miss. Um, they can't miss. They, they don't move the feet, and where do you want to kill the bird? They've run out of swing. Their hips block the rotation of the top half of their body, and so they, they call it windscreen wiping or rainbowing. Mm-hmm. And they, it goes clunk, and you can see them swip, swip, yeah. <laughs> switch the weight from the front foot to the back foot, and the gun rainbows or windscreen wipes over the target. I get and, it. Uh, and that's the, the secret is, is tr- truthfully, the footwork um, is as important as anything else, and it's, it's footwork gun mount and a gun that fits and after that it's practice lots of it <laughs> lots of it is exactly right so um is there any difference in the gun mount from uh, what most other styles might teach um if you look at the sporting place um you know fit ask uh, it, it, it's you know the same gun mount obviously trap shooters shoot pre-mounted skeet shooters shoot pre-mounted uh, a lot of sporting clay shooters um, that shoot pre-mounted, but I th- personally believe that um, the best of the shots um, shoot from a low gun. You know, not, not at skeet and trap, but in sporting clays. Yeah. And so, if you are a good, you've got a, you've developed or you've practiced and drilled a really good gun mount and, and you know good fundamentals, that translates straight into your um, into your bird shooting because. After all, the, the clay shooting for these targets and, and the guns were invented for bird shooting before they become uh, a clay target sport. You know, uh, uh, and I'm it, glad you brought that up because I, uh, you know, I remember when uh, it came to the states and it was first called hunters' clays, and uh, mm-hmm. and and it was more uh, more realistic presentations, if you want to call it that. Uh, you have distinguished in your in your promotional materials between British course design and shotgun courses in the U.S. I think. It, are you designing differently for different people for different reasons? Uh, uh, well, if if the uh, person you know, you always ask questions like anything, but if if the person just wants a nice recreational course, you know, say. For, for in, in relationship to an hotel or something, you can um, not, not hotel in, in in relationship to a, a venue, you know, like a, a, a location, like take Orvis or anything. They they're catering for people who haven't shot before or just medium shooting and so on and so forth. So and that's all fundamentals again, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. that's the simple stuff. Um, it doesn't change as you move in, into um, competition shooting, but um, then. It, there's elements of some like to shoot pre-mounted, some like to shoot with it just out of the cheek. Others uh, shoot fit ask, and there's a line on the fit ask vest, and and, and that they'll uh, they'll use that every time, regardless of the target presentation. Um, I, I'm just a great believer. I look <laughs> look at the target or the bird, and um, if you've grooved that gun mount, and, and this is the important thing, it's eyesight. Um, 
I don't know if your uh, listeners can do this, but if you hold a thumb up um, and look across the room at something and look, stare really hard at it, you'll get two thumbs in your, in your vision, your thumb, the original one, and the peripheral one. And it's called visual diplopia. So when we look at something like threading a fishing hook, you have to really stare at the, the eye to get the, 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 the thread through it. And it's the same with shock and shooting, two fields of vision. You can't see in both fields at the same time. And the thing about um, shooting a target or a bird at distance is your eyes have to be at distance. They cannot be referenced in the gun. The gun's in your peripheral vision, like driving a car up the, the freeway. You, you, you've got a car, two tons, doing 70 miles an hour, and you're keeping it between the lines and the other traffic while you look for danger 20 cars up the road. And it's the same, what you have to do is exactly that. You have to, that's why fits are important, you have to be completely 100% laser locked on the bird. And it's not uncommon um, if you see really top class shooters, they'll have no beads on the gun. Yeah, yeah. And I know one instructor who literally, when, when somebody arrives, they just unscrew the beads and throw them away. Well, that's better than knocking because, it off against the wall, which I've heard as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the, see, the, the thing, what happened is, if you think about the original musket that that sort of pioneered this country, it, you you could shoot it. It had a bead on it, so you could put it on a deer or an Indian, and then you could put shot in it and shoot a bird. And everybody grew up with a bead. And there's two things that you need to see or be aware of. Awareness is more 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 correct is the bead and the lead. Yeah, yeah, there, there's an awareness of it, but your total focus is on the target. You know, if the bird's 40 yards away, your eyes should be 40 yards away. Right. And another good little tip is lifting your eyebrows. Oh, really? Your, 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 your eyelids cover about one-third of your eye, like gathering capacity. And so, you know, it's there to, to protect the eyes. Um, when you're shooting, you, I don't know if you've ever seen people, you should lift your eyebrows up. You should look bug-eyed if somebody was looking at you. You gather at least a third more light. You know, and, and, and all the bird is is, is 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 light. And, and you lift your eyebrows up and you can see the bird. I, when I teach people to do this, you see the clay from a blur and all of a sudden they go, I can see all, all the edges on it. You know? And oh. if it's got the dimples, the white flyers, they'll turn around and say, you know, I can see all the dimples on them now. Now, I've got one more thing to worry about when I'm mounting my gun. I'm going to have to work on that one for a while. No, it's nothing. You just lift your eyebrows okay. up. Okay. You, know, you get ready to shoot. You uh, can normally lift them up. Boom. I love it. Yeah. Uh, uh, how about uh, you, you mentioned it in terms of musketry and, and a bead for taking, you know, shooting big yeah. game. But uh, the, the word lead, is it, 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 I'm sorry to say, but it is a loaded word. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and, and it took me many years to understand how something flying at 25 or 35 miles an hour needed to be led by a shot charge that was coming out at 1,400 feet per second. So uh, explain, yeah. is, is there lead in the Churchill style? Uh, yeah, there is. But, but the, the, is, is the, the, the old thing about it is, is you don't look at it. You're aware of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. You don't measure it. You're aware of it. And, and see, what you're, what's happening is, when you see the bird or, or you see the clay target and off the top end needs four feet of lead, well, what, what you're doing is you have to maintain hard focus on the target and the gun's in your peripheral vision. Yeah. You're aware of it. As I say, the same as driving a car. You're yeah. driving a car up the freeway. You're aware of where the car is between the lines and the other vehicles, but you're looking 10, 20 cars up the road. And it's the same with your shooting. You, 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 you have to learn that your eyes uh, are out there and they'll send the information back to the to, to the brain to, to you know to, to move the right amount to the target, and the, the lead and the bead and everything else is um, there. There's two things you need to see, and you can't look at is the lead and the bead. There you go. All <laughs> it's right. Just, it, it's awareness. No, oh, and you I know? won't and I won't and, say um, them again because then you'll look at them. So um, uh, memorize yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, they, 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 yeah. go ahead. Um, no, no. I, I have a I have a pressing question for you. Um, yes. If somebody shows up with a semi-automatic shotgun at one of your workshops, are you going to take it away and give them an over and under or a uh, side by side? 
Of course not. Okay. You know, like what's the, I, 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 um, I, I before Beretta back in the days, I did the shop for Beretta, or the shop with Beretta, mm-hmm. and then um, the the I had a, 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 um, a semi-auto. The only thing I could afford. I bought a Beretta. It was a 303 at the time. It shows you now they're like <laughs> 491s or something. So anyway, and I I won ski championships with it, all kinds of things, you know. Like, and and I shot it for ages. Shot it at pigeons, you know. You you, you couldn't take a semi-automatic on a driven shoot. They'd, they'd look down the nose at you, you know. But you but, could, um, but you it, could it, take an over and under to the UK and shoot if, if you choose. Oh yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 there's no problem and, and a lot of the bigger shoots have, have got magazines in other words you've got the, 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 um, uh, rooms gun rooms that yeah, are just full yeah. of guns of match pairs and singles and you can go in and you know the, the loaders especially um, the loaders are usually uh, good shots or, or they're working within the business or they've been doing it so long and they'll they, they, they'll give you all the advice you need um you know the the, the 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 favorite one is the biggest reason for missing fast birds, and I'm talking about the feathered kind, is that the clay target, no matter how fast he came off the trap, is hitting hair resistance at the same speed, and so therefore it, the, the target is consistently slowing yes. or, or is slowing down. So you can measure, you you you, you can work out four foot of lead and put the four foot on it, but when a bird cuts its wings. And, and goes into like a stoop, as a, 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 in effect. It, it, the reason it isn't flapping anymore is it can't go any faster. Yes. So it cuts its wings, and, and it's, not, it, 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 it's screaming. But because there isn't movement, the back brain doesn't you know, c- compute just how much lead it needs. So it might need six to eight feet. So what you do is you, you put what you think on it, and as you pull the trigger, you push the gun as fast as you can. You push it and um, that's what connects with the bird is that acceleration of the gun so you do everything else really smoothly and carefully and then just push and you believe, you'll, you'll knock birds down at distances you couldn't believe and you'll hear good loaders when you're in the line you'll, you'll hear them saying push sir push you know and what they're trying to get them to do is that they're measuring the bird off and the bird's going to pass a barrel so that push keeps the barrel in, in front of the bird I I and, can't uh, wait to have a loader. <laughs> I need all the help I can get. Well, yeah. well they they usually good shots, very enthusiastic, and in some ways I don't mind loading at all because I, I enjoy it because you can help the person connect with the birds, and in some ways um, you, you're shooting them as well. You know, your, your input oh, yeah. for, the, for for the gun. It's there, and, it, it, and it's a great day out, you know. You know, but, um, it, 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 go on, sir. I, I, I never thought about it that way. I, I guess I'd, I'd never known enough about loaders, but it, you're really a two-person team when you're in that butt, aren't you? Oh, yeah. Well, that's what they call the two-gun tango. Uh-huh. If you, if you see, yeah, if you see the loader and, and, and the gun, and, and often the, the really, you know, the, the people who can afford it and, and, and the, the, uh, are shooting on a consistent basis, they they have a loader that's been with them for years. Yeah, yeah. You Make... know, in, in the big country estates, the, the Lord would have his gamekeeper to load for him. Sure. And so on and so forth. So what happens is, if you're standing, the deadliest move a bird shooter can make is with his feet. So the bird's coming hard left to right over your right shoulder. You've got to step round with the left foot, drop the shoulder, and punch through the bird, push through the bird. And the other way, you turn round, drop the right shoulder, and push through the bird. And your loader will be telling you, you, you know, as, as you're moving your feet and coming round, he'll be going, push, sir! You know, and, <laughs> and that's where the, the lead comes from, because if you measure the bird off with the right lead like you would a clay pigeon, the bird ain't going to be there when the shot arrives. And it's that push that, that, that you do everything the same as if you were shooting clays, but it's that push at the end of the shot that, that puts the cloud in the right place. Love it. Chris Batha, you've uh, shot a, I, I'm afraid to guess how many targets, feathered and clay, and you've watched many, many other people do the same. Of, of all those other people, what is, what is the most common or the biggest mistake that we make when we're shooting? I'd say looking at the gun. Yeah. 
you know, it, 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 it's, if you've got good fundamentals, as I say, stance, posture, head position, a gun that fits, um, that should take care of it and, and practice, obviously, with plays. But the, the, the big thing is people, the, the two things you need to see that you can't look at is the lead and the bead. And if you're looking at both of them at the same time, you're in bundles of trouble. How about um, the one thing we could all do more of to become a better shooter? Uh, well, obviously practice, but it has to be perfect. Practice makes perfect. And uh, one of the little things I like to do, and, and people might find it strange, is you get a tennis ball and you write four numbers on it, it to be five, three, one, two, whatever, on the sides as if it was a square. With a, with a sharpie, mm -hmm. then without punching it through your hand, <laughs> push <laughs> yeah. a, a needle through it and put a piece of fishing line and with a knot on and hang it down at shoulder height uh, in, 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 in your garage, in your room, anywhere. And what you do is you take the gun and you just touch the ball and the ball will be spinning round and so you're three and you touch the three and that means you're really looking at it when you pick the three out, the five. And if you want, you can do it with a yardstick and just paint a black line down the top of the yardstick arms length and touch the ball. Don't hit it hard so it's bouncing all over. Just touch it. It'll, it'll swing from side to side and spin around and go number three five times, number three. And it, that's teaching you to ignore the barrel because you'll never touch the ball if you're looking at the, the, the yardstick. <sighs> if, you, if you're looking at the ball, it'll work, hand and eye coordination. And um, the, the other one is in the mirror. You, wherever you've got a mirror, safe in a den or whatever, put the mirror on the wall, head eye, put a little marker on there, a dot or, or a thing, and just stand in front of it, look at your eye, and bring the gun under your eye. Never look at the gun. Just work on your gun. Man. If you've done the bowl drill and the mirror drill and nothing else, uh, your gun mount would kill about 80% of what you shoot at or break 80% of what you're shooting at. That uh, that it's, is a, it's all hand and you know, hand and eye coordination. That's all it is. Absolutely, and those are so simple and easy to do for any of us. We don't need any lasers or any big rooms or even clay targets. And I'm promising you. Uh, I've already promised all of my listeners that uh, I'm going to shoot a hundred rounds a weekend all summer. Now I'm going to shoot a hundred rounds all week doing that with the tennis ball and the mirror because those are two things anybody can do chris batha if yeah, hey by the way everybody if you want to learn more about all of this stuff uh chris batha shooting.com you never know he might actually have an opening for you in one of those butts over there in jolly old england <laughs> uh but there's a ton of other things you can pick up there from uh from bespoke guns to dvds and everything in between maybe a class or a workshop chris uh, this has been incredibly enjoyable i know you come out my way once in a while and uh, and visit our friends up at highland hills i uh, can't wait to see you the next time we're both in that neighborhood in the meanwhile thank you so much for helping us become better shooters here at the upland nation podcast well, you're more than welcome, and uh, everybody out there as well. You know, if you can take one little thing away from it that makes you a better shot, it was worth the uh, half hour listening. Thank you so much. Have a great day. And you take care. Bye. Yeah, and we're still, still got a few things more to cover here, including a public access strategy. Well, not a strategy, but some place to go in our This Land is Your Land segment. So uh, don't go away. Lots to talk about coming up right after this. And the first this is that the Upland Nation podcast is brought to you in part by HappyJackInc.com. Happy Jack is a company that's been around for a long time. Practical, basic, dog-centered solutions to everything from parasites to pad health. HappyJackInc.com is where you learn all about the gear and the remedies they have. Right now it's flea season. If you're looking for a non-toxic solution that you don't have to put around a dog's neck or dab between their shoulder blades, Try Happy Jack's DD33. 
You've seen me use it on television. You spray it on that day and it keeps the fleas and ticks off your dog that day. No long-term effects, no long-term requirements. And if you're looking for something in the kennel or the home or wherever your dog stays, consider the flea beacon. Look it up. It's all at happyjackinc.com, happyjackinc.com. This Land is Your Land, a great song by a great songwriter, but also the truth when it comes to America and hunting. Now, a lot of folks look at Wisconsin as the place to be for the king of game birds. That would be the rough grouse. But I've had a hell of a time over the years in Minnesota. I thought I'd just bring that up one more time for those of you who are looking for a great earlier season opportunity for these great, great game birds. There's 43 grouse specific hunting areas created by and managed by the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Now, the thing I love about those upper Midwest grouse areas, and this is a perfect example, is they cut trails through them. In the wintertime, the snowmobilers use them, but in the fall, it makes easy walking for the humans while the dogs do all the hard work in the tangle on both sides of those trails. If you're looking for one in particular to start with, try the Chippewa National Forest. 1.6 million acres of great hunting. And with that, it's time to say goodbye and thank you. Thank you to Chris Batha. Learn more about Chris's operation at chrisbathashooting.com. The show is brought to you in part by FindBirdHuntingSpots.com. New material every week to help you find places to hunt like that above. And this week, Dr. Tim Hunt's guest blog on the importance of fat in your dog's diet if you want peak performance day 2 through 22. Sure hope you'll tell your friends. Sure hope you'll rate us at Apple Podcasts. Leave you with this from famed actress, diamond merchant, and leading lady in general. She says, oh, by the way, that's Elizabeth Taylor, who says, some of my best leading men have been dogs and horses. Glad you could join me. My name is Scott Linden. Thanks for listening to the Upland Nation podcast. Until next time, hope to see you in the field.